Hello and welcome to Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. I'm Becky Parker Geist and I'm your host. Audiobook Connection is your place to learn about the audiobook creative process in discussions between the authors, narrators, producers, and post production teams that bring them all together, as well as guests who have listened to the audiobooks and have questions for the creative teams. This podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Hi, I'm Becky Parker Geist. I am the host of the Audiobook Connection podcast, Behind the Scenes with the Creative Teams. I'm also president of Bay Area Independent Publishers Association and the CEO of Pro Audio Voices, providing audiobook production, distribution, and marketing, as well as podcasting services. And today, I am excited to have with me Bob Rogers. Bob is the author of The Laced Chameleon, and other books as well that we'll hear about today. Bob, welcome to Audiobook Connection. Thank you, Becky. It is a pleasure to have you here in Merida, Yucatan, Mexico. Woohoo! Yes. All right. Well, let's jump right in. Tell us a little bit about your background, and let's start with your background and then when you wanted to first start writing, what got you going in the first place? Oh, my goodness. Well, I have to give credit where credit is in that case. Well, back in the day, while I was at IBM, and I was there for three years after my military career. That was 33 years at IBM. So that means that I am uh, ancient. Once upon a time, <laughs> mail, I received this, paint, this photo of a painting, a bulletin back in the day before the internet. So that's what we're talking about. Whoa, back, way back then. Way back there, yes. I looked at the photo of this painting and it picked a young soldier leading a horse. He was a buffalo mm-hmm. soldier. So I looked at it and it allowed to no one in particular, someone should write his story. My wife overheard me say that. She was all the way across the kitchen from where I was standing in. So she said, well, why don't you do it? Huh? Me? (laughs) I didn't know she had heard me. That is how it started. Yeah, about how old were you at that point? Well, my goodness, was I in 1991? Uh, That's a good question. I don't know. That means that I was 50, about 50 years old. Right. Yes. All right. So she said, you got to write. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. Say, so, yeah. Well, don't you do it? <laughs> yeah. That, that's what started the whole thing. So there's 1991. Ben didn't publish anything for a while. So the first book I published was not about that Buffalo soldier, even though I was doing research and traveling across the country from where we lived in Berlin all the way over to New Mexico and visiting all the states between. I chickened out. So I decided I'd write something I could do. Handily, I read about a baseball player and his young love. So that was my first book. And it was published in 2009. That was the first book. Hitting life's curveballs. Yeah. Yes. That young soldier, he's a young soldier too. So he left baseball and was drafted into World War II. But that's that book. But I went back to Buffalo Soldier Research and actually finished the book and published yeah, somewhere around 2014. And it's been book after book since 2014. Ah, sounds like you got bitten by the bug. <laughs> you so that's got how caught. I started. You love, yeah, so that's great. And uh, tell us, exactly. uh, yes, share with the us. Bug. Yeah. I have, the bug is not really. <laughs> well, good, because you're writing good content, so that's great. Tell us a little bit about, now, did you start off with just writing for fun? Did you have an idea about a particular kind of impact you wanted to have? And so tell us a little bit about how you started in that realm and then how that may have developed or changed or not. Yes, well, I start without a thought on what was going to be the result, except one thing, just one. All I had in mind was that I was going to meet that challenge that my wife gave me and do a book, The Soldier. Someone should write his story. 
So that was my intent when I began. It was not a hobby. It was serious from the Library of Congress all the way out to uh, the reservations uh, and uh, set aside for the Mescalera Apache, as well as battlefields that happened back in the 19th century. So everything was very serious from the beginning. No, not a hobby. Wow. And currently, are you, yeah, tell me a little bit more about the impact you'd like to have with your writing and how you have developed over the years from that starting point of very serious intention. Well, yes, back to the intention that included going to the University of Maryland for creative writing. Well, another little spark of inspiration actually lit a fire into me from that point. Once upon a time in a class, there was a student that told me that my premise about writing about a person who escaped slavery and joined the cavalry was impossible. That just couldn't happen. Why? She said that don't you, everyone knows that slaves couldn't think, so you can't do this. Yes, yeah, so you just want to be all wrong. Well, I stood the, and I'm very, very much in command of my faculties most of the time. But I found myself standing in front of the classroom with my chin hanging down to my chest. I could not oh. believe what I was heard in the 21st century. Unbelievable. She gave, she gave me a great gift that day. My classmates sprang into life and defended what I was doing and told her what they thought of her question. I didn't have to say a word. I oh, couldn't. Thank goodness for that. I, I could not have said a word anyway. <laughs> well, I'll hang open. But yes, she does not realize, or she did not realize, uh, probably not until this day, what a gift she gave me. That kick in the pants, so to speak, or that spark that, that really made the fire roar in the furnace propelled me forward to, uh, to finish that book. Besides, that the soldier depicted was being at more than a hundred at that time, more than a hundred years ago. I had yeah, coincidentally served in the state unit during my Vietnam service. I didn't know wow. that until later. <laughs> wow. Wow. These That's people amazing. They did what well, they were in the same outfit I wound up in. So yeah. So that's a part of the background on how I started. And that connected the dots from way back when the wife said, you do it all the way to, oh, we're very serious about this. And yes, we've been pretty writing at the universe. Wow. Well, I just honor you so much. What a tremendous example you set in terms of being able to look at that moment when you were faced with such appalling ignorance and and to be able to look now at that and recognize that as a gift. So I just want to call that out and just I really honor that that whole attitude and and you for that. So so tell us also no, so you shared a little bit about the story of the Buffalo soldier in terms of the inspiration, what in what got you going from that. Where else do your stories come from? What do you find is exciting inspiration for you for the next book, whatever is germinating? <laughs> Very good question. Really, the thing is, writing for the purpose of aiming to educate. That came from a professor at the University of North Carolina that I was interviewing. And he told me that even in my first book, just begin, that I would sell many times more books than his books ever sold. And he, at that point, had written 25 books. He said, Bob, people don't buy history books. Make stories. So therefore, mm -hmm. entertain to educate became mm -hmm. my tagline. So that's what I do. So each new historical novel, and that's pretty much all I do, historical novels, that is exactly the reason that I write whichever book comes next. 
and the one after that, and of course the one after that, and um, that's why. Wow, that's great. And tell me, tell us a little bit about your upbringing, your parents, and storytelling in that context. What was it? Well, yes. My dad was the consummate storyteller. Just a sentence or two about my dad. He entertained my mom by telling stories. He entertained his siblings by telling stories when I'm not supposed to be listening. But my job was to eavesdrop <laughs> on his stories. I loved his stories. <laughs> now, this man is correction. I said he was. He's passed on some long time ago. But uh, my dad was actually older than the country you now know as Nigeria. There was no such place as Nigeria when he was born. But following his example in uh, telling stories and this uh, professor's advice to me about uh, writing about history is to make stories. So that came, that's easy. I'll just follow what my dad did. <laughs> Thinking of my dad and my mom, I dedicated my most recent release, which was which happened in June of this year, a book called Two Rivers. I dedicated it to them and one other fellow. That fellow's name was, what's his name? Ben Thornton. Ben Thornton. Ben, most people probably never heard of, played man who managed two plantations in Mississippi. The plantations were owned by brothers. The oldest was Joseph, and the second was Jefferson. Last name, Davis. Yes, you're right. President of the Confederacy. Oh. Occasion of the new book to those three people, my friends and uh, Ben Thornton, as an example of that is an answer so to speak to my gift giver way back in the, in the day hmm. yeah. about, well, let me give you examples of uh, people that actually go out and accomplish something and it didn't have to do with the color of their skin. Yeah. Wow. Let's, let's shift just a little bit in and talk specifically about the laced chameleon. Oh. And let's start off with the title. Tell us about how you selected that title, what that means. Actually, I didn't select it. My editor helped me with that title. I'm awful with titles. So I am very <laughs> grateful to her. <laughs> I don't even remember. I had three or four titles and she's, oh no, Bob, no. <laughs> and I'm a because, and as she pointed out to me, well, here's this octoroon, quadroon person who was a star at the balls in New Orleans that were given for those for that. And what was she wearing? She came in as you described, Bob. She saw me. You described yeah. her in these blowing gowns and covered with lace and all of that. When she later decided to become a detective, she was to disguise herself. At one time, actually portraying a 14-year-old boy, the yeah. chameleon. She put those two yeah. words together in an article in front of it, and you have the title, The Laced Chameleon. Yeah, great. Let's just take a short pause and we'll come right back and talk more about the audiobook. October 2023 is Thriller Month on Amplify Audiobooks. Don't you dare miss it. AmplifyAudiobooks.com Unravel the enigmatic world of The Laced Chameleon by Bob Rogers. Narrated by Becky Parker. Mystery and intrigue await in every chapter. New Orleans native, Mademoiselle Francesca Dumas, is a kept woman. At age 18, in the second year of the American Civil War, she is the concubine of a rich New Orleans banker, Joaquim Buisson. Born a quadroon, Francesca leads a sheltered life of elegant jewels, gowns, lace, and lavish balls until a bullet shatters her dream world. After an assassin murders her man as Francesca stood beside him among a throng gathered atop a Mississippi River levee on April 25, 1862, 
she begins an investigation. Can rookie detective Francesca's passion, determination, and wit overcome a kidnapper and three-time murderer? Get your copy today at AmplifyAudiobooks.com. So let's talk about the audiobook production. Now, I had, well, we'll just save that. Well, that'll be the reveal. You can <laughs> Tell us about the process of finding your narrator. Wow. Oh, man. I hope I never have to go through that again. Oh, I had no idea where to look for a narrator, but I knew what I wanted. I was trying to find a person who spoke English, very comfortable with it, yeah. without, without any hesitation. Well, but I needed a French accent. Or that the person could do a French accent. My neighbors on that and, and uh, other acquaintances said, well, I know a lady that was born in Paris and she's been in the U.S. for what? However long. Art sounded really good. Oh, she speaks uh, perfect English. Stage presence. No, no. That didn't work. So I launched a, I mean, a search on the internet. Mm -hmm. And I did get responses right. from Cameroon and from France, in addition to people coast to coast in the U.S., from North Carolina all the way to Oregon. I didn't say Oregon, all the way to California, too. <laughs> that, was an, that was an ordeal again, because it was either the English with no French accent, or the French was too heavy and very small out of English. But the story did have a happy ending. So I looked out and I, I found a person that <laughs> did everything I, that was promised, everything I expected, except one. And that was the surprise when she sang the lyrics to a song. And once I heard that with my earphones on, I, I almost cried. The, the water came up in the yeah. eyes. But didn't quite spill over. So, yes, brought tears to my eyes because her voice was so beautiful and it was so unexpected that I'm hearing the song that I had altered. It's a real song, but I had changed a few of the words in there. But she didn't. That was the end. That's the end of that story about, oh, then I don't want to repeat that story ever. <laughs> I don't want to live through that. I meant, I okay, should now, say. Okay, now, most of our listeners may not know who that narrator was. Oh, <laughs> let me introduce Becky Parker. <laughs> yeah, that was great. I loved, I loved working on that book. I think that audio book, that was great. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Ian. You rescued me. <laughs> and now, unlike most authors that we work with, you are skilled as an audio engineer. So you had a different post-production process than is typical. So tell our listeners a little bit about all of that. Well, that's because it all worked because they had a great person to work with. So when I listened to the recordings, they would send back part of a chapter. And we were able to do that, not the whole chapter. Just what needed mm -hmm. to be touched up a bit, so to speak. Yeah. So my, my narrator, that Becky person, would do the touch up, so to speak, and send that back to me. And I had learned how to actually plug that in and continue from actually doing recordings myself. So that turned out to work well. I had explained to Becky that at one time, I probably had a lot more skills from my computer background than I had money. So that was a part of the driving force down that way. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Let me just stick a little bit longer with the audiobook production process. Was there anything about the process overall that surprised you or that others who might be in a similar situation as an author working with a narrator that they might like to know that you discovered along the way? Well, yeah, that was, that was an illuminating ebook written by this <laughs> Becky Parker that uh, was my guide entering this new thing. 
So in the new thing, I followed what she recommended, <laughs> actually bought the products that she said would work with her. And uh, we, uh, we went through. So it's uh, not that much task if you are able to put together the right hardware and the right software and just follow yeah. directions and get up and try it. Practice. And maybe you'll end up like John Grisham said, where he narrated of his books. I'll never do that again. Or you may say, as I said, <laughs> bring it on. Let me have the next one. So uh, I have recorded in the least um, on the, under uh, my logo, an additional audio book. And I am hacked through another one, but writing the uh, print books takes precedence over everything, including making audio books. So when I get a break, I'll finish that audio book awesome. and then there's another one coming. There's always a, whatever it is, print audio, there's always the next one. That's so great. I love that. What would you like your readers to and listeners to take away from your work? Now, you could speak specifically to Laced Chameleon or the your body of work in general. Well, it's the same, actually. Uh, the Laced Chameleon, all the way through what I'm doing now in the project I have ahead of me. And that is, listen to my stories. Be interested in because you connect with the characters at a human level. You see their relationships. You see the people around. And by relationships, the immediate family, and then extending out from that to the far acquaintance and how they get on with those. All set in the backdrop of American history. It's sometime out of our past. So I've dealt so far with three centuries, 18th, 19th, and 20th. Of course, at this point, I am not about to touch the 21st century. They'll have to go <laughs> further into the rearview mirror first. <laughs> yeah. so, so what what folks should get is, as I heard last evening in a book club Zoom meeting, is these new things that they learn just as a matter of course, because they're able to see the backdrop behind the relationships that are built with the characters. And it just happens to be that my transportation is a buggy drawn by a horse, or if I'm hauling something, it's two or four horses and we're pulling whatever, and it takes this long to go from here to there, just as a matter of course. And these mm -hmm. kinds of trees, and yes, and because I can't have firearms, I'll make bow and arrow. How do you make an arrow? So th those kinds of things just fall in. And, and as these people expressed to me last evening in the book club, they learn so much about just what the people live through as a matter of just going from day to day, as well as the political scene behind them, the laws, the way that society work, whole nine yards. That's my, that's what yeah. I intend to do with that educate part. So they entertain by following the story and whoops, I learned some stuff. <laughs> Bonus. Yeah, that's great. Exactly. That's great. I think Laced Chameleon would make a terrific film. And I'm curious now, if it were made into a movie, mm -hmm. do you know which actors would play your characters, your main characters? Oh, wow. So, Francesca is my hero in the middle. Okay. So with that, Kerry Washington comes to mind. I don't know much about Kara's life, but I'm just thinking of the person that I described in the book and looking at a photo of Kara that, mm, yeah, why not? Well, like that. Yeah. Same thing uh -huh. with um, Edna, uh, her fast friend in the story of The Lace Chameleon. And there I'm thinking Viola Davis, Viola Davis. And the person that I think would fit there very well would be Tom Cruise. As well, the yeah. Senior <laughs> Detective yeah. Philip Rousseau. Yes. 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 I could, I could see Tom playing uh, a detective. Uh-huh. With, yeah. with a French accent. See? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's that's great. Well, uh, tell us something interesting that about just personal about you that your readers probably don't know. 
Oh, my goodness. This difficult separate me from baseball. <laughs> Softball would do if baseball was not able at the moment. So same thing. So I played for a long time in uh, various leagues. And one of my most cherished memories was learning to bat left-handed following my hero, Ted Williams. And doing that, I hit the longest home run that I still have a video recording of in my mind. Sweet. Which I play <laughs> probably too often. But when I was, <laughs> when did that happen? That, you asked me about how old I was when I started to write and I had to figure it out. But I don't yeah. figure this one out. When I was 57 years old, I played on a championship softball team with people that were 25 to 35 years old. Wow. That's mm -hmm. impressive. I, I love didn't that. On, and then I didn't say I was on the bench. I said I played. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I want to highly recommend to our listeners to get The Laced Chameleon and to learn more about you and the work that you're doing. How can our listeners find out more about you and stay in touch with you? Oh, great. Okay. There's a page on the website called Team, T-E-A-M, like a baseball team. Yeah. And so that page is revealing in that it has a bio on it. And one can learn even more than they actually need to know if they will subscribe to my newsletter and find out what it is I think and, most dangerously, what I'm up to next. I love that. And your website is bobrogers.biz. So B-O-B-R-O-G-E-R-S dot biz. So when it, and you That's can correct. also find, yes, you can find a direct link to get the audiobook on Amplify Audiobooks right from Bob's website, which I would highly encourage. So, Bob, I want to thank you so much for taking this time with me. This has been awesome. And I now know more about you than I did before. And I'm really excited to to have you part of the Amplify Audiobooks community. We have a big event coming up. October 2023 is our Thriller Month, and The Laced Chameleon is an active part of that promotion. Bob, thanks for being with me. Great. Thank you for the invite. I appreciate it. All right. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you next time on Audiobook Connection. Thanks for joining us for Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. Please take a moment to subscribe at audiobookconnection.com. The podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Learn more at proaudiovoices.com. Again, thanks for being with us, and please join us next week.